uh, thrilled to be able to have a little bit of a conversation about uh, boards, uh, boards in tur difficult, turbulent times. It's uh, interesting, unprecedented in some ways, all that's going on in, uh, in our community. And uh, we continue to sort of try and get our hands around what this is and what these ramifications are, how we're going to be able to get ourselves uh, open and back up again, when it's going to be safe to be able to do that. And um, so this series that we've been uh, putting out as a part of the center has just been an opportunity for us to be able to have a little bit of a conversation, uh, share with you some of our thoughts and perspectives. And I really encourage you to uh, participate, uh, engage in uh, sharing your thoughts. So, I mean, in particular, I think today, um, I brought some help. I got some backup. So I've got some folks who are going to be able to help me uh, kind of answer this uh, question that's a, that's a tricky one. Uh, and so most of you know Royce Hickman, or many of you know Royce Hickman, who's been in the, in the community for, for many years, a, a longstanding community uh, person with the Cham Bryan College Station Chamber of Commerce, uh, transitioned a couple of years ago into a position with uh, community liaison, so working a little bit with the community, or the Chamber of Commerce, but also working with the university. So he's really been a, a very valuable part of our uh, team, really, at the center, who's helped us connect to um, the community and help us get the word out about what we're doing and also help us connect to folks who are interested in what we're trying to get done here. Um, and so Royce has been instrumental in helping move some of that forward. And then uh, I've got a good colleague, Judy Millison, who's here, who's, I've worked, Judy and I have worked together for years, uh, way back on graduate school days, uh, practically. So uh, Judy right now is, uh, uh, I'll give you a little bit, professor and director of the MBA program at the College of Charleston, where she joined, she's been there since 2018. Um, prior to that, she was at Ohio, uh, Ohio University. Um, and, um, so she, as I said, the position there at uh, Carleton College of Car Charleston, but her research is a strong link between theory and practice and focuses on nonprofit administration capacity with a special interest in governance. So Judy and I have been on boards and panels together in a variety of places. She publishes uh, similar kinds of stuff as me. So in a lot of ways, I think we think about this in a very similar kind of stuff. Uh, MPA from the University of Hartford and a PhD in public administration. So, uh, I'll let, well, I'll transition to them in just a minute. I'm just going to set the stage uh, for sort of some thoughts. Uh, we're going to review kind of how we think about boards and roles. So this is a little bit of a review, I think, for most folks. Nothing in there will look too surprising. And then transition to Judy to give a kind of reaction, reflection to those roles and the way that I kind of talked about them. Um, and then Royce can give some more perspective. And then we'll really, we'll open it up for questions. So I'm hoping that we'll have, you know, maybe 30 minutes or more of where we'll be able to have you involved in the conversation. I think it'll be very useful um, to, to really just ask you how it's going and get your perspective on uh, uh, what, uh, how you really, how it's going and, and, and what are you doing in reference to, to your board? So as a real sort of simple, uh, perspective here, I'll um, review this slide that we've used for years in some ways. Um, Kenny and I worked on it. Uh, you know, Judy, would this would all look very familiar to her in the way that we sort of think about boards and roles. We have some both right theoretical or conceptual models that sort of guide the way we think about roles and functions. And so I, you know, found this to be a very useful um, framework. So if we start up here at this idea of governance roles um, and kind of look at those cluster of activities, if you will, or responsibilities that board members have. So this is all pretty straightforward, right? We know that the board takes some leadership around setting up guidelines, bylaws, setting in place rules and how we, how we function and operate. The board takes some responsibility around making sure that there's monitoring and, and setting the budget typically, um, thinking about where the money is and how the money comes in. I know a lot of our boards will, every, mo every month we meet, right, we'll review the budgets and take a look at some of these things. You know, we also talk about the importance of thinking about the way of the programs and the activities of our organization and what we do and, and both internally and externally, there's a lot of information that can be very useful to to track and boards should have some responsibility 
I mean, in, in a lot of ways, this set of, of, of tasks, and the list could go on, the unpack them, which is what we'll be doing here in a few minutes, um, and then place them in context, right? So what happens within your particular organization? What happens in the way that you all think about carrying out these functions? And then in particular, you get a crisis like this, or you get a sudden change to your external environment, how do we have to shift our roles? How do we have to adjust? What are things that we need to prioritize? So this governance set of roles really is a, in many ways, it's the accountability function. The board serves this really critical role to be um, to the external constituents to sort of say, we're watching what's going on in this organization. We're making good use of the money. We're following good procedures. We're, we're taking good care of the people. We've got the basics set in place in some ways. So it's a, it's a core function, um, but it's only part of what a board needs to do. So then there's this whole other set of, of, of activities over here um, that some folks might call service roles, or I mean, it's just a cluster of ways of thinking, but it really has to do with, so not only does the board oversee and look at what's going on, they really need to contribute and give to the organization, and that's hence the phrasing there of a service role. This idea that the board members need to give back to the organization, both intellectually, and so that could mean, you know, providing some guidance around the way that the organization thinks about its strategic direction or its strategic orientation. Where are we going to be going? Setting in place policies, setting in place goals, objectives, planning, right? So that process of planning, board members bring their intellect, bring their perspective, bring their understanding and help the organization move forward. We're also aware that we look to our boards to help us around fundraising, thinking about all of those steps associated with fundraising. And then a key thing we hear from a lot of executives is we need our boards to engage in this sort of external relationships, helping us manage stakeholders and thinking about the way that we're connecting to people outside of our organization and really contributing in a way that helps manage the multitude of relationships that nonprofit organizations maintain and sustain, both around funding, around legitimacy and reputation. And so there's a whole set of stuff there that we ask our boards to kind of help us with. And then in addition to that, there's a set of stuff down here. And I've, I've been an, always been an advocate that board members need to think carefully about how they take care of their themselves, if you will, how they take care of how the board works, functions, what it does together, who you bring on the board. A lot of my work um, talks about who's on the board and how really important that is of thinking carefully about the people that get brought onto the board, the way you bring them on. So you can see there's a whole set of things there associated with the work that board members are not only attentive to oversight, not only attentive, attentive to uh, building the organization, they're also attentive to themselves and contributing to the way that they function as a group and that they are uh, ensuring continuity and ongoing uh, ability to sort of function and operate. So with that, one of the questions that comes up is, well, how much time should my organization allocate to particular, you know, how much time I as an individual board member or as a group or as an organization, how much should I allocate to some of these? You know, and Kenny and I have played around with some different numbers around some of this stuff. All of this is really contingent on context and that's why this conversation is of value. So we sort of, we emphasize these surface roles is, is particularly important. A lot of organizations are looking to their board to facilitate and connect them with the external environment. It's really tricky to manage those external relationships. And so a lot of times we look to our board to help us with our fundraising, to help us with the public relations role. But we know that it's really important to, to oversee and we also know it's really important in reference to the goal, uh, groups and roles and processes. And this ebbs and flows is another sort of way of, of, of depicting that same thing in some sense is a little simpler, right? It says you spend a fair amount of your time in that service role, you spend some uh, role of, of your time here and you spend some time. It's not like these, these percentages are cut in stone. In fact, I'm gonna turn it over here in just a minute to Judy and kind of get her thoughts on this. But it has to do with as a general rule of thumb, we're looking for people to, to allocate a bit more time over here but any given organization is going to face different kinds of stuff. So 
um, with that it is initial kind of setup. Uh, I thought I would invite Judy to, to, to give her perspective or give her thoughts on some of this stuff as well. Judy. Yeah. Thanks, Will. Uh, hello, everyone. And so when, um, you know, Will and Royce and I spoke a little bit yesterday, some of the things that we talked about was, you know, that when we think about these uh, roles and responsibilities or these kinds of functions that, that we perform, the question becomes, you know, what do we do and, and how are these roles affected when we're, we're in this, you know, pandemic time or this time of crisis? And, you know, we, we sort of hash this out a little bit and, you know, not everything is going to be exact, but all of these same sorts of responsibilities uh, hold even in times of crisis. And how we think about them just might be a little bit different uh, when we're operating as usual and then when, you know, we're operating in, in, a, in, a, with a, in a different environment or with a different set of circumstances. And that you still, I, you know, I would suggest uh, that you still spend the bulk of your time in that kind of, you know, outward reaching service sort of role, that fundraising, public relations and kinds of strategy roles, right? And then what does it look like at this time? It might look a little bit different and, and that we have to remind ourselves that we always want to start with this whole notion of mutuality of service, right? This notion that we're all in this together and that people, your stakeholders and your constituent groups understand what it is that you do. And so how might you communicate with, with your donors and your stakeholders at this particular time? You know, and, and maybe what the way that we start off is we think about what it is that we have and what it is that we might offer our communities. You know, can you waive fees or extend memberships or maintain donor statuses or offer counseling or tutoring or training or mentorship or friendship? If you're an arts organization, can you put your exhibits online? You know, how can you offer what it is that you do to your constituents at this time where they cannot be physically present in, in, in spaces? you know, indicate that you're in this relationship for the long haul and that social distancing uh, doesn't, doesn't have to mean that you are not committed to social connecting. Those two things can, can coexist. And if you're looking for, if, you're, if you find yourself in a position where you do need funds for a particular reason or purpose, maybe just being clear about what that plate is. I, I read a story about a YMCA that took this sort of similar approach where they maintained, uh, they extended memberships. Um, but what they did was that they talked about um, that they needed to furlough most of their employees. And that even with those furlough, even with the furloughs, they remained committed to providing health insurance for all of the employees and providing and covering the full cost of that. And so their appeal was that it was an ask of their, their donor base that if they found themselves in a position to make a gift, they, that that gift would be used to offset the cost of those, the health insurance. So it was this sort of mutuality. We'll, we'll extend this membership. We're here for you in the long haul. Uh, we're, we're together in this. And we're also experiencing a fairly, uh, you know, a fairly, um, desperate situation. We want to be able to offer this for our employees. So the key is, for me anyway, as I think about this, is the key is to really think about how we can offer support and seek support at the same time. So that our requests are really embedded in this larger expression of mutual support, empathy, empathy and solidarity, you know, that, that we're in this together. Um, you know, and I, and I think about what public relations looks right like and outreach looks like at this time. And so we have we do have history on our side here. It's not like this is the first time that we've ever been in a situation in the country where, you know, we can't interact with people um, in a, in a face-to-face -face or, or, uh, or um, in close proximity. You know, we can take a little lesson from history and you know, FDR's fireside chats, right? And so I sort of was thinking about this when I was talking with um, some students the other day and, and that we, we kind of need to keep those we hold most dear close. How will we share stories of how our organization has innovated to meet the needs of the people we serve? Um, what kinds of amazing things have happened 
among our groups that we might share with people who care deeply about what it is that we do, right? And so we don't necessarily have to do that through all familiar sorts of ways, our newsletters or stuff, but maybe we log on and have you know meetings like this or have a call-in session where people can learn about uh, what it is that we're doing and how it is that we're responding um, uh, to the crisis. And as I think about our governance roles, you know, some, some board members might ask questions about, you know, how can I be of best service during this time? And so I'm sort of thinking about this quote that I had heard that, you know, good leaders solve problems and great leaders kind of anticipate them. Um, and so how, you know, one way that you might be involved as a, as a board member uh, might be working with your leadership team um, and asking those really hard questions and considering some of those like kind of worst case scenarios, brainstorming all of those different actions that you might be able to take to be ready if something happens, right? And so instead of waiting for something to happen, uh, how might you respond um, and engage in, in those sort of responses? Uh, so, you know, again, sort of this notion of thinking purposefully about how you're, you're gonna prioritize um, you know, another thing that you might do, sorry, another thing you might want to do as, your, as a board member is really think purposefully about how you're going to prioritize those who are most vulnerable. You hear news report after news report after news report that the, uh, the virus and the effects of the virus are affecting different populations differently, right? And that those differences are found along all those familiar lines of race and income and education. So how are we as an organization and as a board going to center the needs of those being most affected by the pandemic? And how are we gonna be really conscious of who's not at the table, whether that's a virtual table or a physical table and, and looking around to see who it is that, that isn't there I think another way that we can think about our outreach and our, you know, our group processes is to really be a support of factual, timely, and measured public communications, right? We need to make sure that the people we serve get information they need in ways that they understand. And who knows better about how our constituent group receives uh, information than us? I mean, we're connected to them very closely all the time um, and that uh, we have an obligation to help our constituents and our communities manage, um, manage their understandable anxiety and keep them from falling prey uh, to the dramatic nature of uh, breaking news updates, if you will. And I think the final thing I'd like to offer is that remember, our, your organization is not unique. We're all facing these challenges together. Uh, be intentional about your strategy, stay connected to the people who are closest to you, and share your resources generously. That these expressions of mutual support will be much appreciated and remembered long after uh, this crisis passes. Thanks, Judy. I appreciate yep. that. That was That's great. Royce, you want to give some thoughts, and then we'll open it up for some questions. I know folks yeah. are sending stuff in the chat board, too. So. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Will, and those locally know uh, a lot of things have changed, but one thing's not changing, I'm going to start off with a howdy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I appreciate being a part of this, uh, and Judy, thank you for your comments. Uh, one of the things I did is, is went back and looked at, uh, 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 or actually researched articles about boards in crisis, are in you know uh, turbulent times. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, there's quite a few of them that have been written in the last three to four weeks, which you could understand their demands out there. But uh, I thought I would share some of the common things that they have in here, uh, and you'll see there's some overlap to things that uh, Will and Judy have already talked about. But the you know now more than ever, the board needs to provide steady and adaptive leadership in partnership with the chief executive officer, or the executive director, whatever, is necessary to work closely uh, with the chief executive to govern and manage the situation. 
as well as address uh, the threats that may come up. And while the CEO is responsible for the operational planning and execution of these plans, the board should be reviewing and responding to the organization's strategy and providing feedback that will be critical for the CEO. And you've got to be, everybody has to be flexible in their planning and consider all the possibilities they can about the crisis. And um, when, when they're reviewing these things, uh, you know, you need to consider what aspects of the situation affect our organization. What are the, what are our organization's greatest vulnerabilities? Uh, what are the questions we can anticipate from the media? Uh, they're, this is a time where they're very interested in how this is impacting us and how do we deal with that? And how do we prevent the worst case scenario from occurring? Um, and when you, when an organization starts putting all this together and planning, uh, they recommend the use of experts such as a human resource specialist, financial officer, uh, a legal uh, person. I know when I was uh, president of the chamber, I always wanted a CPA on my board and I always wanted a, a lawyer on my board because they can provide advice at critical times like this. If you don't have one on your board, find someone that you can use for that. A number of things that seemed to be common were that were was important for a board to be doing at this time with their with the staff is one risk assessment and management, and um, you know they, they need to be sensitive to the existence of the the various risks, and then try to find a strategy that deals with the the risk and allows the organization to con continue. Um, the, the, the board's got to look at the current and future impact the crisis will have on the, the economy overall, their organizations, their staff members, their board members, and then the, the impact it'll have on our community. Obviously, all of those things come to play um, and impact the board. Um, the one thing to look at and make sure you're aware of is the uh, your current insurance policies and any risk mitigation practices that are in place. Uh, understand if there's something there that's, uh, that's available to you. Uh, can, you've got to also continuously monitor the situation and assess uh, the risk that might arise as this uh, situation uh, evolves. And um, it's, you know, it's challenging times and the board and the staff have to come together more now than ever and work through this. And, you know, one thing to get straight early on is who is managing the crisis and what are their duties? Typically, I would think it would be the CEO, but that needs to be uh, uh, determined. Uh, what's the media strategy? Uh, what are the logistics for convening board meetings? A lot of you are already into this and I understand that. So in going over the recommendations, it's a good thing, time for you to check off whether or not you've done these types of things. And then you need to be sure you have contact information immediately available to you on the key stakeholders, your donors, your members, your government officials, the media, policymakers, and any partnering organization. Obviously your board, you probably already have that in place anyway. Um, and um, you need to have talking points for any anticipated uh, questions that may come up. Uh, the uh, other situation that they're talking about here is um, number two was organizational events. How are you going to deal with those? I, I was uh, impressed that the Salvation Army, Army is going to do a, an event uh, Barrel with uh, Brigadier General Ramirez speaking, but you've got to decide in a lot of uh, organizations, uh, these events are major fundraiser for them and how are they going to offset the loss of that revenue. Number three is financial investments and finances and investments. You need to understand your cash position and your revenue stream. Um, I know for years I struggled with getting the chamber board to understand the need for a cash reserve. And um, it, fortunately, over the years, we've built a cash reserve up a little bit at a time. It's kind of like what you do with your retirement plan. 
And what I would encourage you to do, if you do not have a cash reserve, this is a time your board's gonna be really sensitive and understanding about the need for a cash reserve. And uh, it's a time for you to be planning uh, or what you can I personally didn't ever think it would be a pandemic. I thought more of, you know, from living on the coast, some a hurricane, a tornado, some type of a tragedy like that, what West went through with the explosion, but you never know what it'll be. But in order to continue to operate, you've got to have resources to do that. Uh, you've also got to maintain, everybody talks about maintaining the relationships with their donors and everybody talks about continuing fundraising activities. I like Judy's idea you can get people to buy into what you're doing with uh, letting them know how you are doing that. The other thing is uh, critical is belt tightening as soon as, as soon as possible. You know, where is it you can reduce some expenses that puts off making staff decisions? Um, look at whether you have any flexibility in endowment funds. And obviously I think the board has to understand, uh, are we willing to, enter into a, a, a loan, you know, are we willing to get into a debt situation? Uh, and number four is staff and state, uh, stakeholder safety. Uh, and I hadn't thought about this personally, but what are you gonna do if one of your staff member comes down with COVID-19? Do you have a plan for that? Do you have a plan for notification and how do you deal with that? And uh, so it's important for you to uh, have, do the things that are necessary to keep your staff and your board uh, uh, safe and uh, make sure that uh, they know how to protect themselves um, and that all systems and technology are in place to support those efforts. Uh, next was uh, board, meeting, board meeting and decision making practices. You have to be sure your bylaws allow you to do meetings like we're having right now. And if so, how are you gonna record votes uh, where some people may be muted and, and uh, do you, do you, if it's not visual, do you, you need to have methods to do that in order to make sure you're, you're legal. Uh, and, and the uh, other thing I think that you can do in this case is consider delegating more responsibility to your executive committee, uh, a smaller group, or you may wanna set up a, uh, uh, crisis management committee or task force that uh, can operate a little more uh, quickly. And um, the uh, next was uh, everybody talked about communications and communication planning. And uh, you've got to be sure that the communication is uh, uh, good, really good between the staff and the board you have to decide what information you're gonna share with the public. Um, and uh, you also need to make sure you have a communication tree within your organization. Uh, and everybody talked about communicating often. Everybody talked about being consistent with your communication. One thing I like is that the uh, Center for Nonprofits and Philanthropy is consistently doing this on Thursdays at noon. And that's the type of thing they're talking about. Everybody talked about maintaining relations with your donors and everybody said, don't stop fundraising activities. There's still a way to do that. And then uh, the last was a, a ongoing assessment. Uh, it's not a one time, get it set up and then you're, 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 you're set. It's important to get organized and then to continue to evaluate the organization, continue to evaluate the situation, continue to look for answers to being effective. You've got to keep delivering your message. Uh, I think it's extremely important that you realize that time is of the essence. Uh, there's, there's not time to uh, kick the can down the street. You've got to deal with those things now. I think the other thing that I would share before I close out on this is be sure you stay in touch about the, the impact this is having on not only your staff, but uh, from a board standpoint, the board, because you may have board members who are 
their companies are dealing with difficult times. You may have board members who have been furloughed or who have lost their jobs. You may have board members uh, who have family members who have the virus. And um, so it's very important to stay on top of those things. One, one thing I thought about was if you had a board member who had lost a job or was furloughed, it's a great opportunity to invite them to be a more involved part of your uh, organization. And they have now time to do some things that uh, would take some of that role off the staff. And I would close with the, probably the most important thing to, for all of us to remember is in, while we're doing all of this other is to take care of yourself. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Royce. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of, so a lot of thoughts there. I'm going to, I'm going to ask Kenny, maybe I'll, I'll, Kenny, did you want the next slide or should I turn this off and uh, just have a conversation? Maybe um, we haven't had many questions uh, float in just yet. So uh, one thing I would say is if you do have questions, feel free to go ahead and get those in the chat room. But Will, maybe we should go to the next slide just to go ahead. Oh, you do? Okay, I just, of course, I just turned it off. So. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and get that up, but just yeah. a few questions. You stop and this then, uh, and then I'll come back. In, in the interim for either of the three of you all, uh, Bill, Jimmy, Royce, one question that did come in was asking, how do or how should organizations go about communicating news related to the cancellation of uh, what would be considered major events? So uh, would that be considered as um, a negative message or what would any of you all recommend in relation to the cancellation of events at organizations at a time when uh, you all just recommended that we want to make sure that we communicate high? What would be a recommendation there? Royce, do you want to take, do you want to start on that? I don't mean to call well, on I'll you. Start, yeah, I'll start it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a proponent of negative communication. Uh, and uh, everybody's aware of our situation and I think, you know, that you, you, talk, you start off, you know, because of the current situation and our interest in keeping uh, our staff and, and our members safe, uh, we are um, announcing that this event is not going to occur. Now, if it's something that you can, uh, uh, you can do at a later date, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of not saying canceled, but saying is been is being postponed, uh, or it, it, we're canceling it now and expect to announce a, a future date once the uh, the factors uh, provide for us to do that safely. Um, I, I I do think it's important to get that message out as soon as you can. But obviously, uh, people want to know what what you're planning to do in relation to uh, um, whether it's, I'm sorry, th that they're going to want to know whether it's canceled period or whether it's going to be rescheduled. Um, and if nothing else say, you know, we're canceling this year's events, but look forward to uh, the event that uh, at, at uh, this time next year. Judy, did you want to add to that or? Uh, sure. I, I think that, you know, I, I would always start with something positive that it's the, you know, I know many of you have been looking forward to this event uh, in the best interest, you know, or uh, out of great concern for our constituents and the people we serve. We want to make sure that everybody's health is at the fore and we're unable to maintain our currently scheduled event. If you've had an, if you can think of a way to provide some sort of alternative, uh, you, we can't do the event like this, but we thought since pe many people had the date on their calendar, we might do something like this and, you know, some sort of an alternative uh, that in a way to engage people at that same time. And then, you know, sort of like what Royce was saying, we're looking forward to the fall when we might be able to reschedule that event. So uh, I, I've been so incredibly impressed with how innovative and creative, like if you know a teacher, like what kinds of things are they doing to engage people? 
like just kind of snitch an idea uh, that other people are using to engage engage folks if they've already got that time put on their calendar how might you use that time uh, to you know have a fireside chat or to have some kind of uh, interaction with your organization that might not be that exact event but might be a way for you to to reach out and to engage the only the, uh, thank you judy and i think the only thing i'd add to what royce and judy just said to that in reference to the communication regarding an event um, all that's good advice is, is also recognizing that certain people have maybe different, slightly different information needs. So people do want a positive message, but there are some constituents that are going to expect a little, maybe a telephone call. And again, that's potentially where a board member could, if you, as long as there's some clarity around what we're supposed to say. Um, so clarifying the message with board members, but then also asking board members to consider making telephone calls or having a, a secondary conversation or a follow-up conversation. I think um, sometimes we we get in the, uh, we're anxious to get a message out, but sometimes we don't always follow up with particular constituencies that maybe need a little bit more attention or deserve a little bit more attention. And so is there a way that boards can play a role in some of that uh, and prioritizing a secondary communication. So not only the main message gets out, but a follow up in some way that board members could potentially play a role. I mean, you know, think about how many uh, different kinds of ways that we've been able to communicate with each other now that we've been locked in our houses, right? Um, it's kind of been surprising the way that people are connecting, but also our organizations can begin to connect in a way that, and I, I agree with Judy's observation there that we hadn't thought about before. So it's a good question. I suspect there's even folks, you know, and if you've got other ideas, feel free to throw them out on that chat line too. I'm, um, and if you've done something as well, uh, I'm sure people would love to, to sort of hear what some of those are. Hey, Will, I'd just add the Salvation, what the Salvation Army is doing is a good example of how th th they found an alternative. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, maybe I would take just a brief second to chime in so we can get to our other questions. Um, but uh, Royce, to your point, I actually sit on the Salvation Army board. There was an initial discussion to simply cancel the event. And the conversation that we eventually got to was we're unsure, uh, you know, where things are going in terms of this pandemic. So how far do we go with canceling events versus trying to be a bit more innovative and still hosting the event, but that it be virtually instead of uh, in person. And so uh, we found that to be a pretty big challenge just to even think about how will we do our largest fundraiser, which keeps our doors open for the year, virtually versus in person. And so we had a pretty healthy dialogue of a split between those that wanted to cancel and uh, those that uh, really poured into the conversation that we don't know when we can reschedule this thing. So we may as well go ahead and try to find an opportunity to do it now uh, versus canceling that out. And I think uh, more so to the specific question, I don't believe there to be a such thing as uh, that sending a negative message. If anything, we need to be as transparent as we can um, we don't want to take the blame as executives of organizations that that might seem negative, but we really need to be honest, truthful, and transparent about what's actually going on at all organizations. Let me stop there and go to um, a couple of questions that I have on deck, but the first one is, um, any of you all can respond to what type of success, uh, not in this environment of a pandemic, uh, success that we've seen with online fundraising versus in-person fundraising generally? Do we have uh, any literature or anyone familiar with what that might look like generally? Anybody want that one? I mean, it's tricky, right? I mean, because there's, because, because the, I mean, the competition in some sense um, amplifies when you get out onto Facebook and it gets so, yeah, no, I mean, not, 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 a, not a whole lot of advice in reference to, to, from my standpoint. I mean, I do continue to think about the importance of, of uh, stratifying and thinking about particular stakeholders. I mean, one of the key things for, for social media is those uh, sort of advocates or intermediaries, people who can pick up on stuff, right? So we see the importance of if there's somebody that 
carries your message for you. And again, board members are a potential. Anytime that you can get somebody with a slightly higher, a slightly bigger profile online can be a way that a message can get carried forward. Thinking about a group here in town, right? It gets picked up by an athlete and the athlete pushes some messaging out. I mean, that can, so, I mean, it, it it's tricky. Uh, because uh, there's a lot of messages that are getting pushed out. There's a lot that can be done, but that's just in reference to social media marketing and social media communication, which was sort of the first thing I went to in reference to this, but that's just a couple of thoughts. Will and Kenny, I have an example from Family Elder Care in Austin. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Um, I'm on the board and the largest fund and, and Family Elder Care provide services to seniors and the disabled so that they're able to age um, in their homes for as long as possible. And the, the uh, biggest fundraiser is, is a fan drive. And it's been the biggest fundraiser for years. Well, the fan drive includes um, music events. It includes a number of large-scale um, in-person events. And so what we are doing, and, and you can go to familyeldercare.org um, and take a look at those messages. The, um, the entire fan drive is now online. Um, one of the things that we're going to do is we have a number of music-related events and the musicians have agreed to do um, online, um, online private concerts. It can't be public because of copyright and ownership of songs and stuff like that. But um, you will be able to join um, for online music events. So uh, they've done a pretty good job of, of shifting the, um, the messaging uh, to online, and and they're um, hoping that all of us board members are going to spread the word about that. Right. Too. Thanks, Deborah. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, I, I say I have a quick thing about fundraising in the online uh, market. This is an area that I work quite a bit in, and the reality is we have to say that fundraisers we're we're all facing this for the first time too. Uh, and we're figuring it out. So we're gonna try and continue to provide more information about you know, how you can think about fundraising strategies moving forward. But there are a couple things we do know. One, if we all push our events back to November and we already had events planned in November, we've gone from having none now to um, communities being overwhelmed by you know, requests in the fall. So that's something that we've, as we've been talking with different nonprofits about how they're shifting what are other alternatives that you can do? So it's taking these events online. Um, there has been some really good success. I have a couple examples here in Houston uh, where the um, two organizations have hosted galas that have both come in over half a million dollars and they actually exceeded goal. Um, and they, they were terrified. They've never done this before. It's always been an in-person social event. So there are at least two of those examples, and I'll try and talk about those more um, in the session that I do next week. But another thing uh, that we're seeing over time, especially the last 10 years, we've seen a tremendous shift to people being comfortable giving online. So it's really how do you message and how do you make it easy for them? And there are a lot of great statistics around, you know, the number of people who prefer to use credit cards now. But the one thing we do know is people aren't opening their emails. And if you're like me, you're getting emails from any place you've ever shopped at in the last 20 years uh, about their store hours now and things like that. So it's getting lost. But a trend that we're seeing a huge uptick in is um, giving by text. And so there's an organization called Give by Sell that's actually changed their the name and how they're branding themselves right now is to say engaged by sell instead of give by sell. Um, but it's still a, a way for you to reach out because we see that 97% of texts are being open. So that's something that a lot of fundraisers are experimenting with. So if you can't take your event online, you can try something along those lines. And the other piece would be to try and say, sorry, we have to cancel our event, but would you consider still allowing us to keep that, to keep your gift this year? And we have an example of an organization that has done that. Um, here in the Houston area where 70% of those who have already purchased sponsorships or tables allowed them to keep the funding. 
So I don't want to take more time than that, but I thought that might help with some of the direct questions about uh, around. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and that highlights our session for, thank you, Angela. I mean, that highlights our session for, ne for next week, right? So where you'll be able to really get into some of these fundraising, talk about it a little bit more, as you sort of, especially with the orientation toward going forward. Kenny, it looked like you've got another thing you're thinking about there. Yeah, just uh, one for perspective to, uh, in response to what we were just uh, talking about. Uh, one is, uh, I, I see from a couple of folks here, uh, Daphne and also uh, Carol Goldsmith have mentioned that what they've done to investigate uh, online giving a bit is going into collective efforts that are happening or taking place in any of your local communities. So folks that are shifting to Giving Tuesdays, uh, folks that are shifting to uh, Brazos Valley Gives or uh, 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 the Lufkin East Texas area Gives, wherever you may be from, uh, now is definitely the time to think about collectively what can we do to add to the impact of giving generally as we've all heard and are saying that we're all in this together. So we've been encouraging partnerships. We've seen that happen with our local community foundation and our local United Way. So if there's opportunities like that in your communities, try to take advantage of those. That might lend some credence to uh, what your thoughts are or learnings from uh, more collective impact around online giving. Uh, this next one was a, a great scenario to present uh, for this meeting, and that is, let's say your organization has closed based on a board decision. Um, as an executive of that organization, then if you feel that it's necessary to communicate with donors, how do you work in that environment where a board has said, we're closing our doors, yet the executive of that organization feels like we still need to be communicating with our donors. Can someone add, uh, Judy, maybe you want to take that one for us? So, um, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. So I'm not really sure I, so what, what's happening? I'm kind of not sure of the parameters of the challenge. Is it, yeah, is it temporary or permanent? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, what I took from the question was that this was a decision that a board has made to close the doors. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, which we found out even in our local community here, approximately 14, 15 organizations have just said, we're closing our doors, we can't provide services. Right. So mm -hmm. with that, as an executive, still responsible, passionate for the mission of that organization that still wants to communicate with donors, any advice, guidance in a scenario like that? So again, I, I think the, I mean, th it sounds like it's kind of like a cop-out, but I don't think it's a cop-out. I think that whatever decision, whatever led to the decision for the board to close, that has to be, I, I would lead with that. Why did the board make the decision to close? Was it related to health considerations? Was it late related to the safety of the community? Was, you know, to sort of lead with that. And hopefully it's for all positive good reasons, you know, to protect the constituency serve, to make sure that the organization has the resources or reserves that it needs for when we be, we open up. Like what, if this is a, you know, in, if it was a, uh, museum, you know, okay, you can kind of understand why we chose to close the doors. People aren't allowed to be out. They're not supposed to be there. They're not supposed to be in the museum. We're not supposed to congregate. But if it's a food pantry, then that's kind of a different scenario, right? So why did they make the decision to close? Ideally, it's going to be related to some sort of greater good than just the good of the organization or the constituency served be able to highlight that greater good and to be able to say that, you know, the closure will allow us to come back even stronger when the restrictions uh, are lifted, you know, and, and, I, and I think that these are not, we're not lying. We're, we're simply helping our community to understand what is behind the decision-making. And, and, and I think that goes a long way. I think that, when people just see what's happening in the community there you leave all that stuff up to 
interpretation. Oh, well, it must have been this or it must have been that. So kind of take that away, take that skepticism away, take that unknown away and and make it clear what led to those to, to the decision to close so that, you know, people aren't attributing meaning to something that is completely wrong, right? Got it. And, and yeah, I'm, if, if, I'm if I could add uh, briefly, uh, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with Carol. And I think one thing, particularly assuming it wasn't a permanent closure that you're going to open back up, this is back to where ongoing communications and consistent communication is important to let so people don't forget about you and they do understand you are planning to uh, be back in business. Thanks, Royce. Yeah, and I'm, I'm learning in uh, just a further exchange that uh, a temporary closing during uh, the, okay. the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, but I imagine a, a, a tough scenario for an executive of an organization, should they totally let go of their responsibilities during a closure, or no. do they still have an obligation to yeah. communicate uh, yeah. as the executive, yeah. even if the only one left, I guess? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, 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 I right, Kiki, they're being tempting to sort of say, oh, we're all, we're all on sabbatical, we're all uh, on furlough, and so we're not going to try and move forward, and we're going to wait till we can get going again. But no, absolutely. I mean, I think every list of thing that we start talking about, so maybe you're not making, but the, the, the planning procedures, the putting in place of engaging people, trying to continue to engage board members and to continue to engage people in what are we going to be doing next? I mean, when I when it, when the po question first got posed, you know, I thought, well, maybe it was a real, you know, closure. I think some organizations potentially are having that conversation. We may, we are, you know, we, there, we don't have a lot of money. We may have to, this may be enough to finish us off. We know that there are small businesses that'll be facing that conversation. But I would, one of the things I would look in a message around that too, is who are my partners? Who are the people that I'm passing off back to Judy's observation? How do you continue to say we had, we had value, we had a, we had a constituency and this is how that constituency is going to get taken care of, or that's right. how the purpose and mission of this organization is going to be taken care of because uh, an affiliated organization, a partner organization, somebody is taking up some of the work that we were doing. And then you make sure that your donors get transferred over moved over but no absolutely i think people should be engaged actually using this time to to think creatively about themselves and to engage in planning processes how it's going to happen how you're going to sustain yourself there's there's quite a bit to be done i, I get that there's could be a tendency to want to sort of throw your hands up and say well we'll be back in six weeks and see what how, how things are then but I, I really would advise against it people will become disconnected and lose who you are as an organization Great. Um, uh, one other that's come in here is this is a, a, a broader question that may you know have some legal uh, yeah. uh, parameters. But uh, one question is how to decide when it's safe uh, to bring employees back in to meet clients, and what if um, uh, certain members, staff members, uh, don't feel comfortable. Uh, coming back to interact with clients, if that's the essence of your mission? I mean, the first thing I think about, right, is looking for guidance from, from policy uh, yep. folks. So whether it's a tr trade association or professional association, state or national um, guidance that sort of says, here's the way we're thinking about serving the people that are important to us. And typically all of us can find those kinds of, of resources related to our industry, related to what it, whether we're a shelter, whether we're a counseling, um, whatever, whatever it is, clinic, um, there's going to be some guidance that is going to come from national or state level organizations. Mm -hmm. If there's not, then I look to sort of, you know, county and, and, and other kinds of administrative units that are providing as much guidance as we can sort of put in play. Um, so I look to external actors to kind of help uh, make some sense of some of the environment and provide some guidance around, you know, I mean, a, a good colleague is a, is a dentist and sort of, so how do I, you know, how does he know what he's going to be doing in the dentist office when they go back to practice? He's looking to the American Dental Association and, and the guidance that's being set up there that's being interpreted by state level actors in reference to the policy context that's operating here. And then they see what those procedures are. And so you begin to put those in place. You hope that that kind of decision making 
might give the employee comfort. But I think you also have to be sensitive to the fact that people have differing needs, differing at-risk uh, situations. And so I think we got to be as deferential as we possibly can around individuals and the way that they perceive the risk of engaging in this. This is scary. I mean, I think that there's opportunities for conversations and some perspective on this, trying to help educate people. But I would also, you know, highly encourage Grace um, to the extent that we can and that we're able to do something like that and think about creative ways of accommodating people um, and that. Judy, I can tell you've got some thoughts here as well. No, no, I'm just agreeing. I mean, I do think we have to pay attention to whatever our, you know, whatever national guidelines are out there too. And if the, you know, the policy environment is saying that we can't go back to work, and then people, we can't hold people responsible for making the decision not to go back to work, even if some people are, right? So it's like your sort of comment about grace, right? And it, I, I think from an institutional perspective, we're kind of thinking about that here at the college, right? What does it mean when students don't feel safe to come back? And then how do we accommodate them as faculty and as administrators? And what, you know, what, what's in place, even if, uh, you know, there's a, there's a tiered um, entry system. If what do we do when some students say they don't want to come back to the classroom? They're anxious. They want to wait it out another semester. You know, how do we make those virtual services available to them? And and I think that is the. I, I love your comment. You know, to deal with it with grace because that is really what we're encouraging our administrators and our faculty to do. And and I know that's not a local nonprofit, but we we are we're also sort of hitting a lot of the same kinds of considerations. You know, try to suspend judgment to understand their perspective, to figure out, you know, how we might be able to continue with the same kinds of service or level of service that we've been able to provide over the last six weeks. Um, is it really putting the organization in any kind of jeopardy to have some staff work from home and other staff work in the, in the office, provided that we're allowed to, you know, we're, we're permitted to come back to work. You know, there are some places that they're, um, that we're told we can't go back. I mean, our restaurants can't open because they're not allowed, right? And so what does it look like when they are allowed and, and paying attention to those rules? Uh, one caveat I did not mention to that scenario, but was included in the question, was that they are serving folks online and via the phone. And uh, it, 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 to you all's responses, I would only add that um, that may be our future. And so we have to think about if this is something that we've learned how to do uh, in terms of serving clients online and via phone, is that more efficient? Is it more cost affordable? How would you feel about making a decision and going backwards, if you will, to traditionally how you serve those clients? But it sounded like in this scenario that that was something that they aspired to was to meet folks in person. I know that's the essence of who we are as nonprofit organizations, but just wanted to add uh, that tidbit in as well. Too. What are we doing on timing? Well, uh, that's it. I think we, it's one o'clock. I want to be sensitive to folks' time and that uh, we said we'd allocate an hour. Uh, as you got a little bit of the promo from uh, Angela Seaworth, who's going to be doing our our session next week. I um, encourage you to join us back again, same time, um, uh, same same address here at the Zoom link. And so, uh, and, and if you've got others that think that they could benefit from this, appreciate having everybody here. Judy, I appreciate you, Royce, and thank you very much for joining yep. me this afternoon. It was great. I grazed over uh, one question uh, from Mary McDowell, and that was uh, just about the use of facilities at a and and just real quick, I intentionally decided to leave that to the end. As we know of right now, there's no gatherings at the university until the end of the summer, which goes into the first week of August. And uh, we'll know more about the fall here soon. So uh, Mary, hope that that helps. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for including us, Will. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Will. Thanks, Judy. Good to be with yeah, you. Yeah, you too, Royce. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.